Welcome to Congressional Connector TV with your host, Congressman Sandy Levin. I will head home and look family straight in the eye and say the federal government is on your side, providing support during this downturn and making key investments for the future. And now here's your host, Congressman Sandy Levin. Welcome and thank you for joining me for Congressional Con Connector TV. Today's program is really a special one. We're going to highlight the role of community colleges in our economic recovery. And we have a particularly uh, renowned guest, Dr. Jim Jacobs. I haven't called him doctor before, but that he is. A national expert on workforce development. He's given more than 40 years of his life to this uh, wonderful community college. And recently, I think it was a proud moment for everybody, he became its fifth president just last year. And Dr. Jacobs, Jim Jacobs and his college play a key role in training Macomb County's workforce to prosper in this new economy. So, Dr. Jim Jacobs, we're glad you're here. Thank you, Congressman Levin. And you know, I thought you, I'm Sandy from now on, you're Jim. Okay. So why don't we start off talking about the economic recovery problems, the challenges. You're an expert on this uh, every year. For how many years have you been giving a forecast? At least 25 years. 25 years. And I've had a chance to be at many of them. And what is true for Macomb County often relates to the entire Southeast Michigan economy. So why don't you say a bit about uh, what we're facing, how unusual this is in all of the years of your experience. Yeah, this is the most unusual situation, sort of unprecedented. I mean, what we have here is not just a recession, but really, I would say, I would use the word depression with a small d. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, a real uh, shrinkage of the most important part of our local economy, which is the manufacturing base. And this is not a shrinkage which is going to ever return. I mean, in other words, we're going to have a smaller automobile industry, whatever the outcome with Chrysler, whatever the outcome with General Motors. There are going to be less jobs in the automobile industry, and there's going to be less wages of the people who are remaining in that industry. So what we're going to see is the dominant sustaining and driving force of the local economy is going to be about at least uh, 40 or 50 percent um, less than what it is now. And all our efforts on economic development and all our efforts on innovation are not going to restore just that industry. So what we're faced with is a real need to think about alternatives. And this is where it isn't just a question of retraining people for, for the jobs that exist. It's really a question of also creating new jobs and new are areas. So that's really the challenge. You know, you describe it so well. Before we go on and talk about the next steps and alternatives, say a few words because in Washington it's often lost. Why a reduced automotive sector? It's going to be reduced, but why that sector remains so critical for Southeast Michigan and really for the nation. The impact of the automotive industry not in with it within Macomb, within Michigan, but beyond. Just yeah, say just, a few words. About I mean, it, yeah, it is amazing. We often, uh, you know, read in the, in the national papers uh, the view that this is sort of just a regional issue. You know, it's only the people in Southeast Michigan that are going to be affected. And it clearly is not true. I mean, this, this industry has been extremely productive and profitable. It has created all kinds of jobs in other sectors. I mean, just to use the examples which I think a lot of us are familiar with, General Motors provides greater health care benefits for more people in the United States than any other private uh, you know, company. We have huge demand uh, on uh, various steel manufacturers, the largest consumer of information technology technicians in, in, in the United States is the automobile industry. Uh, if, if it wasn't for the automobile industry, uh, a significant part of our gross domestic product would be a lot smaller. 
And, and the linkage between the automobile industry, the steel industry, the plastics, the, the advertising industry, the, the, the largest advertisers in the United States are, are, are automobile companies. So what we're seeing is a really ripple effect. And one of the things which I think is very interesting about this is people sort of, you know, looked at the news last week, General Motors declared bankruptcy. Oh, so, you know, that's just another thing that's going on in the news and then we'll move on to, uh, you know, the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs or something. Uh, but the reality is we don't even know some of the impact yet of the General Motors bankruptcy. That's still going through the economy. Uh, so that on that level of the companies themselves, um, there's significance. But there's a more profound issue, and that is no nation can have prosperity without an industrial base. Manufacturing matters, and the automobile industry was a great center of manufacturing. And I had a interesting experience just last week talking to a 75-year-old graduate of the Henry Ford Trade School. You know, this was a school that Henry Ford set up in the 1920s. Kind of an early community college. Early community, uh, right, exactly. Really that, that's what it was called, something else. It was right? called a trade, trade school, but they studied, and they studied not just how to make cars, they studied manufacturing as a whole. And you realize that the skill sets of these people were the skill sets that won World War II, that played a role in development of all sorts of products in this country. We lose those skills. In this country, we lose a significant part of who we are. So I, I think that's, that's the, the part that I think is most uh, and we just We need to emphasize this. It's not something that is just regional, right? Right. Just say a few words because we're going to talk about training and retraining. The importance of the automotive sector and the development of technology. Because your college has been working on the interface between the auto industry and new technology. So Correct. just say a word so that everybody understands that the, the, the future of the automotive industry is really important for the development of new technologies. Right. Let's talk about the one, the, the one area just alone. We'll just talk about the movement away from uh, gasoline engines to the electric car, which is a very, very important issue for Southeast Michigan, but it turns out it's a very important issue for the country. And in this way, once we start talking about batteries and storing electricity, it doesn't just mean that we're storing electricity for cars. If we're really going to talk about making electricity out of you know, windmills and you, you know, that are going to turn turbines. The whole question of when you have a wind farm is you have to store that electricity. So the same issues of battery maintenance which go on inside of automobiles are the same issues that we face all over the country in terms of learning how we deal with wind power. So it's a natural spillover. The research and development that is going on in General Motors and in Ford and in Chrysler around the electric car has, is going to have profound effects on the entire electric grid, how we store energy, how we move energy around, because those batteries that go into cars are the same batteries that are going to be used in stationary storage. So this message has to be given not only within Michigan but to the nation. And some of us have been trying to carry this message to all of my colleagues. And we're determined, Jim, to do it because we've lost an understanding in too many parts of this country about what the future of the automotive industry means for the manufacturing base generally. And that's why every country, as you point out, cares about its automotive sector. Right. right? There is no country that wants really to see it disappear and in fact other countries are now fighting to, to make maintain. it strong and perhaps dominant. China, India, Europe is fighting to maintain its automotive base. So when people say, Sandy, why, I mean, is this just something that related to the 12th district or Michigan? And I say, no, no, this is a national issue. So let's talk about training because we're going to have to make some adjustments and the training part is a critical piece, and you're right in the middle as the relatively new president of the community college in Macomb, but you've been working on this for years. So tell us a bit about the role of 
Macomb Community College, and perhaps community colleges generally, in facing this retraining challenge in Michigan and throughout the country. Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, we'll speak about Macomb, but we'll also talk in general about community colleges. I think the, the real um, role that community colleges play on the whole of the United States is that we are the training system. Even though the United States doesn't have a training policy, a national policy, etc., uh, and like other countries who really emphasize this, we kind of talk about education as being decentralized and really something that's local. The best source of training in the United States for adults, for people who want to change their lives, the gatekeepers to the new, the new jobs are the, are the 1,200 community colleges. Each of these community colleges is within 30 minutes of any major metropolitan area. Uh, we have the largest numbers of, of, of faculty who know both the technology but also know how to work with adults. We have commitments to flexibility of classes, etc. So I think we're, we're really, uh, in this situation, uh, the key players, and I'm really happy to see the way the Congress has been doing uh, passing legislation and the administration has been proposing a whole series of changes in, in our workforce and training areas that really promote and, and give us the opportunity to really do well. So getting to, though to our college. Before we do that, yeah. you mentioned the, the effort here in Washington to provide more monies. I think we have a chart that shows what we fought for in recent months. I think uh, all the viewers can see this, this chart. And we were able to increase the funding uh, for, uh, for retraining. And it shows, it's a little hard to, to, to see that, but I've written the figure on the chart. For the year, the fiscal year 2008, there was $273 million for worker retraining. And we were able to add to that in the recovery pro program that you mentioned, so that that figure went up for the fiscal year 09 plus the recovery to $435 million. And that really meant a lot for Michigan. And so I think, uh, as you know, there's more money that's coming, and it should. We're, the, we're, we're an area that has suffered this, this economic downturn maybe worse than any other place. And so we have more people that need retraining. So tell us a little more about what's sure. going on. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, I really want to congratulate the, um, uh, the Congress and the administration for seeing the need to, to put more money into training. And I think that's been absolutely critical. And not only is there more money, but I think uh, the way in which the training programs have been now designed, they're making far more sense than they did in the past. And they're, they're giving us a lot more freedom to really target our training to the people who really need it the most. And here's, in, our, in Michigan, what we're faced with is large numbers of people who may have never gone past high school, maybe even didn't complete high school. But now they're faced with not only lacking a job, <coughs> but the jobs that are going to pay them sustainable wages, that are going to provide even uh, uh, an entry point again to the middle class, almost without exception are going to be jobs that require some post-secondary education. So the training system really needs to be both a system which, which talks about technical training, but sort of merges that with foundation or fundamental skill training. Let me use examples. 65% uh, of all the nurses in the United States come out of community colleges. We have a large nursing program at, at Macomb Community College. We just increased our nursing slots 25% to, to deal with the demand. Because there's, there's a shortage, There's right? a shortage of nurses. We have 1,000 people on our waiting list to get into our nursing program. 1,000. Wow, 1,000 people. And in order to get into our nursing program, you have to spend a year taking science and math classes. Now, the average person that comes into our nursing program is someone who's usually in their late 20s, sometimes has a family, head of household, hasn't been in school, if they were in high school, in 10 years. And they're going to walk into classrooms where they're going to learn 
trigonometry, calculus, biology, biochemistry. Even a congressman would have trouble in some of these classes. Well, you mentioned trig, <laughs> so your, your points will take. <laughs> okay. Your points uh, will take. So we have to figure out a way where we can accelerate that learning for them so that they feel comfortable in class, their motivation is there. They're going to make great nurses. They're going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be really uh, our, our best students. But if you haven't been in school for 10 years and you're not used to hearing, you know, the lectures and not used to doing and studying in an atmosphere where the television isn't on and your kids are interrupting you and all this, you have to really learn that stuff. So a lot of what we have to do in our training and education classes with adults is harness their motivation and channel that and focus that with good study skills, learning some basic found foundation skills, and once you get that, they have no problem. What's very interesting in our nursing program, almost everyone who gets into the nursing program not only completes it, but becomes, you know, we have a 99% pass rate mm -hmm. of the NCLEX exam, they become nurses. You know, we had, we had a round table, remember it was some right. time ago, with people within the county. And they were mostly people who were not 20, 21, 22. And it was interesting to hear the role the community college was playing in the comfort level of people who either had had no uh, college education opportunity or maybe some and were returning and how the college was a uh, was comfortable in part because there were people of their age more or less right and to some extent people with their experience and I remember there was one person I think who was saying they were going to be a nurse and that was never expected but this shortage so let me ask you this what do you say to someone, I'll give you uh, a couple of groupings, someone who has been laid off, mm -hmm. who was not working in a job that was highly skilled, who really wants to return uh, to school if they were there in, in, in college. So they've had some background, but have not had the technical training. Mm -hmm. What do you also say to someone who is out of high school, going back in age? And then let's take the category of the person who was in the auto industry, maybe had a considerable career, but he perhaps took uh, the money to, to, to uh, the so-called buyout, or maybe was laid off. All three groupings, right, are very prevalent within Macomb and throughout this country. So what do you say to, to each of them? Well, I, I think the messages are a little bit different to each okay, group. Let's take each. Okay, but, but there's a couple of general themes that I think we want to emphasize with adults. And the first one is something that we've learned now over the years. We used to think that the difference between adults and younger people were that younger people really didn't know the labor market and didn't know what to do, so you had to give them lots of alternatives and they had to figure out things. Whereas adults, because they were in the labor market, uh, knew what they wanted to do. That's wrong. That's wrong for two reasons. One, most adults, especially in our community, if they've worked in the auto industry, have been pretty specialized. So they really don't know a lot what's out there. Second, uh, adults, just like y younger people, are faced with an economy that they may, when they were looking for a job 20 years ago, the kinds of jobs they were looking at were very, very different than today. I mean, we have nuclear medicine technology that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, so one of the things I, I would advocate for all adults is that they spend a little time on occupational counseling, and that's what we do. We spend time right we up front. We do that within the college. Within the college, with our partners, the workforce board, and I gotta mention that our partners, our, our local workforce development board, John Beerbussy, has been an absolute a champion of the college. We work closely together. We co-locate our counselors. Uh, we, the one thing you want to do also with adults is make sure that they, there's a lot of services and upfront work with people so they, get, they feel 
that this is not their fault that they're laid off. They feel that they can be successful in college. What you mentioned before about cohort, they're with other people like them. We try to hire some of our counselors who've been through our programs so that they can serve as role models. So, the so first one message is come to the community college or to the workforce entity and you will get some, some help. Yes. Somebody will be able some, to talk with you about what the alternatives really are. And also, the other, the other thing I would say in all three cases is you have to be, feel comfortable with the fit. In other words, some, you have to build on your, you, you know, what things that you like to do. We've had some experiences where people, you know, read in the newspaper, well, nurses make a lot of money and I want to be a nurse because I know if I'm in the auto industry, I made a lot of money and I need, I need a job that pays as much. Well, being a nurse in the, uh, is very different than being in the auto industry and you may not have the temperament, the interest, you may not be so inclined to be in that kind of service sector. Uh, so it isn't, you can, we have to get away from the idea that you can do any job. You need to figure out a job that fits with your skills, something you want to do, something you feel comfortable at. And that again is a process. So one of the things we, we encourage for, for adults is that they, they do a little exploration. Now, if somebody though needs a job right away because they have to feed their families and they have to feed themselves, Yes, we can, we say then come into our certified nursing assistant program. It's 160 hours. You will go through this program. You will then be ready to take your test. You'll be licensed in Michigan and we will get you a job. So there's some flexibility, right. some sensitivity. Right. So as we face this, this really frightfully perilous time economically, there's been a lot of pain. You know, we fight to sustain the auto industry, always remembering this downsizing has created some real pain for families in so many ways. It, it, coming, coming out of this system and now heading it uh, and, and working on tra training, retraining, is there some reason for optimism? I think so. I mean, I think there's reason for optimism because in the sense, as we go through this process, we become stronger. We become stronger about ourselves. We realize our own capabilities. We can see that this industry will be smaller, but it will create jobs. It will also be connected to other industries like the defense industry. There's a crosswalk. And we're trying to, 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 we're to, trying really, to make those ties. Yeah, we're trying to really, really emphasize Absolutely. converting uh, some of our talents to a defense industry and having a defense corridor within, 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 with, within Macomb County. So we're really working at that. And there, is, there are some positions where there are shortages. Absolutely. You mentioned nursing. Where are the others? As you, as you talk to younger people or anybody, what are the areas of opportunity? Sure. And, well, the health care is many, many specific ones. Parts of nursing, uh, certified nursing assistants, this whole issue of nuclear medicine. Uh, you know, we now have on one of our campuses part of the Michigan State University Osteopathic Medical School. So we're able to talk about careers in health care on many, many different levels of which there are shortages. There are also shortages in various forms of information technology technicians, cyber security, maintenance of equipment. Uh, you know, for all the software programming and engineering, which is certainly vital, there also needs to be someone who takes care of the hardware. And those are the kinds of things that can't be outsourced, that somebody has to be on site who are able to do it. A whole area of uh, transportation and logistics, not just the truck driving, but the people who schedule the trucks, the people who do air freight, the people who know the packaging of, you know, re requirements in different countries. As we talk about a global economy, and it is, a, you know, a global economy, we have to be part of that global economy. And we'll have to be able to be able to ship packages, to know rules and regulations in other countries. These are, j logistics is a huge area of importance. And, and we want Macomb to be the center in of that. the center. Yes, and, and, right. and we're, we're going to be in the center. Uh, Wayne State University is putting its logistics program on our south campus and the new building we're building for them. Uh, 
And so we take very, very seriously. And, and I will say that as, as, a, as a president of a community college, I think about this stuff every day. Uh, it is not something that we, w w we know we have an obligation to this county, and we're going to fulfill that obligation. I have no doubt, Jim. You've been at it for 40 years. You started as a teenager. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, we also, on this, uh, on our connector program, we take a few of the questions that come into us. So just as a change of pace, let me read just a few of them. One from Alexandra from Warren. I would like to know if the Senate and the Congress will have the same health care that other people do. If not, why? And the answer is, Jim, we do. Uh, my late beloved and I were, uh, have been covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield like everybody else who has that coverage. And by the way, as we talk about health care reform, we want to make sure that there is an option for everybody that will be like the option that we members of Congress have. That's it great. will be just like that. And they'll pay what we pay and we'll pay what they pay. So the answer to Alexander is um, uh, we should be like everybody else, and there are 50 million people who have no health care at all. And so the next one, uh, it says, in our modern word, it seem, world, it seems silly that we can operate electric cars and control robots working on Mars surface, but we can't find a way to prevent and treat simple but dangerous influenza strains that threaten our health. I'll just answer very, very briefly because we've been having meetings on health care and health care reform and one of the real shortfalls is in is is in the effort to have adequate research in the health field and we're determined we did so some months ago provide more money for health research we're going to do better this new congress is determined to to attack anew the the, the diseases that affect all of our families well, maybe we'll end on that note. Jim, uh, uh, you're on an important mission uh, to really help our economy adjust while maintaining what has been a vital core, as much of it as possible. And somehow we want to face the present and also help shape the future. And the community college is so critical in this. And that's why, if I might say so, not to embarrass you, uh, we're proud of the community college. And we're proud that they selected you as the president. You came up from the roots. Really. What'd you start at as we close? <laughs> What'd you start at in what, the community what, college? As, as, as a teacher of s political science in, in, uh, part-time in 1967. Well, may that be a symbol to everybody if we work hard with some luck and effort, we can climb the ladder and you're in an important position. So you're going to help all of us climb the ladder to success. I hope so. Thanks. Thank you.